Welcome everyone to our um, afternoon session. Um, I'm really excited uh, to be uh, moderating this panel. We've been talking about archives of sci-fi and about sci-fi. Uh, and in this panel, we're gonna be talking about panels, uh, archives in sci-fi. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm gonna, just so you know, I'm gonna read everyone's bio uh, before their presentation or an abbreviated version. Everybody on this panel is doing fantastic work. So um, just for the sake of time, I'm I'm just gonna introduce them briefly, but I highly recommend that you go ahead and have a look at their, their bios um, because uh, a, a truly wide array of accomplishments and interests is represented uh, on this panel. As usual, uh, if you have a question, please feel free to drop it into the Q&A. I only ask that um, if you do that in the Q&A instead of the chat, uh, that'll just give me an easier time of seeing the question. Uh, and then once everybody has presented, we will uh, break for, for questions. Okay, so our first uh, presenter is Jacob Adler. Jacob has worked as the metadata cataloging librarian at Bronx Community College Library since 2017. Uh, and his presentation is called Summit of Knowledge, Archiving the Fantastical. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Jacob Adler, and just give me one second here. Thank you. I hope everybody can see my screen here. Um, so today, I uh, I want to thank you all for coming, first of all, and thanks for everybody for attending the symposium. Um, so I wanted to explore today's theme of the archive, quote unquote, uh, by turning things around and discussing the archive within works of science fiction and fantasy, uh, particularly when it comes to the archiving and preservation of purely fictitious or fantastical materials. Uh, in order to do that, we first have to ask what are the essential characteristics of an archive in a real world context? Uh, now, there are quite a lot of different kinds of archives. Uh, from institutional archives like the Smithsonian Library to personal archives that collect the work or possessions of particular individuals uh, to business archives, which help corporations maintain control over historic objects relating to their brand identity. So assigning a singular standard for what an archive is, uh, for what it collects, and for the professionals who maintain it uh, can thus be very difficult. In general, however, we can point to three commonalities of what defines an archive. Uh, firstly, an archive is a permanent structure. Uh, a collection housed in an archive is meant to be enduring and perpetual, and it is not a temporary arrangement. Uh, this is to differentiate them from collections that exist only in transient states, like those that are passed between different institutions or are brought together for an event or some sort of limited context. Uh, secondly, an archives material is non-circulating, uh, meaning that it doesn't leave the archive itself except under very specific conditions. Uh, this is distinct from libraries, which are more likely to have material which does circulate. Uh, thirdly, an archive usually contains materials which are unique and which often have special preservation needs. Uh, this is especially true of archives which collect sensitive material. Uh, this would include old books, photographs, old sound recordings, etc. cetera. Uh, archives exist in part to attend to the needs of such materials and to make sure that they don't become lost to time. So with that in mind, I have contextualized fictional archives, themselves often containing completely fantastical materials, as being both reflective of and inspirational to what a real archive is and can be. And my first example comes from the television program Stargate SG-1, which features modern day military personnel exploring other worlds and quite often coming into contact with aliens and their technologies. 
Uh, Stargate represents what I would call an intersection between hard and soft science fiction portrayals of archives. Uh, the human characters are shown, particularly in earlier seasons, as relying on real-world information technologies and techniques to aid in their missions. But as the show progresses, they encounter things like an alien Rosetta Stone of sorts, pictured to the left, which contains holographic models of atomic structures meant to help translate a set of alien languages. Uh, or they encounter things like the ancient repository of knowledge, pictured to the right. Uh, which is a device that can download, essentially, an entire alien database into a person's mind, uh, slowly overriding their consciousness in the process. Uh, this latter device, incidentally, is explicitly referred to as an archive in the show. Uh, now, even when faced with uh, such wildly advanced technologies, uh, the protagonists always use approximations of real science, including archival science, to improve their understanding of how best to codify and preserve the literal world-shattering information that they acquire. Uh, we can see a more direct archival analog in something like the animated series Avatar The Last Airbender, uh, specifically in a location referred to as the Spirit Library, pictured on the left. The Spirit Library is a location that is described as existing in both the physical and spiritual realms simultaneously, and it is overseen by Wan Shi Tong, a spirit resembling a giant owl, pictured to the right. The Spirit Library addresses several real-world concerns of archives. Uh, environmental control, for one, uh, being that the Spirit Library is shown as being almost completely submerged beneath a desert, uh, as well as the issue of collection development. Uh, Wan Shi Tong here requires that all patrons submit their own unique materials to the archive before they can make use of its contents. Uh, Wan Shi Tong, in fact, is so dedicated to preventing the library's materials from circulating that the entire place eventually passes fully into the spirit world, making it almost completely inaccessible. Uh, this concept of access in archives is one which is both important in the real world and is often explored in fictional archives as Wan Shi Tong considers the information contained in the spirit library to be potentially dangerous in the wrong hands. Now, this concept is evoked uh, more explicitly in the Unseen University of the Discworld novels by Terry Pratchett. Uh, the library, pictured on the left, is a repository of all sorts of magical knowledge, often reputed for possessing a danger in and of itself. Uh, you may have noticed in these illustrations that uh, it's shown that the books in the library are kept in chains. Now, unlike a real-world chained library like the Bodleian, uh, this is not to keep them from being stolen, but rather to prevent the books themselves from attacking or harming uh, the library's patrons. Uh, the librarian, pictured on the right, was once a human being, but was transformed into an orangutan via a magical accident involving the octavo, one of the most powerful and dangerous magical tomes kept in the university. Now, Pratchett once worked for the press board for a series of nuclear power stations, and this analogy to nuclear energy inspired his portrayal of magic here uh, as a thing that is as wondrous and beneficial as it is potentially dangerous. Uh, now, while this is a comical exaggeration, real world archives too have to contend with the potential usages of their materials and the question of who should or should not have access to them. Uh, this question and the consequences thereof is even more pronounced in the materials surrounding the miniatures war game Warhammer 40,000, which uh, describes the Black Library pictured here. Uh, the Black Library is, in fact, an entire artificial world constructed and maintained by immensely powerful psychic aliens. Uh, its contents include things such as the souls of the dead, uh, a tome containing the prophecies of a missing god, and otherworldly insight into chaos. Uh, that's chaos with a capital C, which in the context of Warhammer is an all-powerful interdimensional force of great importance. Uh, the Black Library is described as being both a source of untold wisdom 
any means of keeping dangerous knowledge out of the wrong hands. In fact, the Black Library is described as being almost impossible to access, demanding that any who try to enter be possessed of incredible physical and mental powers. Again, we see this theme in science fiction and fantasy of the importance and danger of information and how an archive embodies a sort of moral neutrality in a sense, dependent entirely on its users rather than its creators. Now, these questions are not as far removed from reality as they might seem. Uh, the 2019 short film Archive of Souls by Valerie Marshall is about an investigator navigating a murder victim's online history, uh, which has been collected by the eponymous Archive of Souls in a search for clues as to the perpetrator of his death. Uh, along the way, however, the totality of the victim's online presence seems to overwhelm the investigator who, after searching through it for countless hours, states that, quote, I can no longer recall why I entered this archive, end quote. The film raises the implication that the increasing specificity and value of an archive, particularly those of a personal nature, can take on a life of its own. It, it raises the question of whether or not a person's digital presence can be considered analogous to their soul or spirit. As archives and fiction grapple with these sort of metaphysical questions, so too do real archives consider the effect that their materials have on the world or how of how to balance access with safety and things like what knowledge is and is not suitable for the public eye. And I want to close with a quote from the philosopher Jacques Derrida, who wrote extensively about the relationship between ideas and the description thereof. Uh, in his work, Archive Fever, a Freudian impression, he wrote, quote, the technical structure of the archiving archive also determines the uh, structure of the archivable contents, even as it comes into existence and its relationship with the future. In essence, Derrida says that our conception, excuse me, sorry, that our conception of what an archive, pardon me, uh, of what an archive could be in the future or otherwise directly informs what archives are right now. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming and please enjoy the rest of the symposium. Thank you so much, uh, Jacob. Uh, that was fantastic. And I, I hope that we have a, a great conversation about this uh, topic uh, later. Um, so moving right along, our next presenter is Rhonda Knight. Dr. Rhonda Knight is a professor of English, director of the Honors Program, and the James Wayne Lemke Endowed Chair in College Service and Leadership at Coker University in Hartsville, South Carolina. And today, or she'll be presenting, excuse me, presenting on uh, a data thief in the archive, reading Sophia Samatar's an account of the land of witches. Um, I'm not sure how I make my screen show up. Or well, there should be um. I believe there should be a, a share screen. Oh, okay. Uh, at the bottom. Okay. I don't really need to share my screen. I just need okay. I to be on camera. Okay. Yeah. You're you're visible. Oh, I am. Okay. Sorry. Yep. I can only see no you. No problem. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Um, all right. So um, thank you, Lucas. Sorry about that. Um, in Sophia Samatar's short story, An Account of the Land of Witches, a graduate student, Sagal Saeed, has returned to Sudan during the end of the Second Sudanese Civil War, probably in the early 2000s, to research her dissertation. Sagal is working on a document from the 19th century BC, the 9th century, sorry, BCE, that is similarly called Account of the Land of Witches. Segal calls it, quote, a document with no catalog, an orphaned textual fragment with no archive, end quote. As such, this document shares much with the history of African-Americans in the Afri African diaspora, 
a fragmented tale desirous of connections and a sense of belonging. As Mark Bold and Kadwo Eshin have demonstrated, Afrofuturism can partially mitigate these desires by creating oral and textual counter memories that serve both as restorative acts and as correctives to false histories. In her essay, Toward a Planetary History of Afrofuturism, Samatar purports that the figure who performs these actions is the data thief, named after the character in John Akumfra and Edward George's 1996 video essay, The Last Angel of History. The role of the data thief is to search out archival moments and recollect them into new narratives that impact the past, present, and future. As such, Samatar structures her five-part short story, An Account of the Land of Witches, as an archive which juxtaposes different types of documents requiring a holistic examination rather than a linear reading. As, it is, as is expected in an archive, each piece of Samatar's short story is labeled However, the readers as archivists, or archivists sorry, are expected to decipher more of the document's provenances through the act of reading. In part one, entitled Account of the Land of Witches, a slave girl named Arda writes of traveling to the ancient African land with her master, a jewel merchant. There she learns about dream science, which is capable of shaping time and obliterating distance through dreaming about specific keywords. These words are the power of dream science. As Arda says, quote, words open doors in the dreamscape, end quote. Each word has multiple meanings that center on connected moods or ideas, which can transport the dreamer to a location. For example, pomegranate variously means, quote, dusk, the rattling of dry leaves. It also means winter. It means black bile and a cloister. It means a tooth. Dream of pomegranates to enter the place of mourning, end quote. Samatar leaves the connections between the keyword pomegranate and all of these other meanings somewhat ambiguous. The meaning of a dream about a pomegranate could mean the dreamer is really concerned about one of these other meanings in a Freudian kind of way. But if the dreamers understand the dream science, then dreaming of pomegranate transports them to the land of mourning within the land of witches. This is how dream science works. One can travel through dreams. Part two of the story is a work contemporary with the first one called A Refutation of the Account of the Land of Witches, which is written by Arda's owner, Taharquo of Quorum. His refutation reveals that Arda escaped while in the Land of Witches. His oldest daughter has Arta's document published and distributed after she found it in his belongings. His refutation exposes his arrogance and spite as he sees the land of witches as a backward and unsophisticated place. For example, the inhabitants do not understand capitalism and they have deprived him of his best slave through their trickery. Part three moves to the writing of Sagal Said, who is researching the first two documents. Her piece is called A Refutation of the Refutation of the Account of the Land of Witches. Her mixed narrative primarily recounts her struggle to return to the United States from her home country, the war-torn Sudan, because she traveled there on the wrong type of visa. Interspersed with her personal narrative are the opening paragraph of her dissertation and other notes about the previous two documents. As violence and bureaucracy keep her from traveling to the location she wants to research or returning to the United States, Seagal becomes more and more despondent. She becomes mentally and perhaps physically ill. She recounts vivid dreams that mix artist narrative with her own plight. This part ends with her, both in her real life and in her dreams, trying to dream the correct dream to escape Sudan and arrive in the land of witches. Part four is notes towards a dreamer's lexicon. The first section of it transcribes the dream keywords and their meanings from the ancient text. And the second section includes new words and meanings that reflect Seagal's modern dream journeys that she adds. The final part of the story, The Travelers, is a first person narrative told by one of the 
one of a group of future explorers who used Seagal's documents to travel through fantastic dreamscapes in search of the land of witches. Their goal is to, to map the land if they can ever arrive there. In this last section, the six characters are identified only by their roles. The harpist, the scribe, the archivist, the diviner, the mountaineer, and the navigator. The scribe writes the final section that the readers encounter. This last section seems so out of place that Samatar is often asked about it in interviews. She explains that she envisioned the first four parts as the complete, as the complete work with, quote, narratives flowing into the next, end quote. But then her editor, Kelly Link, asked her to, quote, open out the conclusion, making it, quote, more estranged and deranged. By adding the fifth part, Samatar makes the previous four parts a real archive and no longer just a fiction about orphaned archival documents. When Samatar creates the dream travelers as users of the documents, then the reader's previous perceptions of order and certainty within the story must be called into question. The paradox of the archive, as described by Jacques Derrida in Archive, in archive Fever, is that it destabilizes knowledge even as it makes it more accessible. In a 2020 interview with Andy Hegeman, uh, Samatar uh, describes her data thief in a way that aligns with the actions of these dream travelers. She says, quote, the data thief is somebody for, for whom all archives are open, who moves back and forth between, who does not live in any kind of linear timeline, who has a kind of stuttering temporality, jumping into the past, going into the future, and the data thief is then working like a bricolure, bricolure, cobbling together a livable history out of these pieces that are rescued from the past, or rescued from the future, weirdly, because theoretically you can also leap to the future, end quote. Part five opens by demonstrating the nonlinear timeline in which the dream travelers exist, with the scribe communicating that they, that they have once again arrived in the diviner's apartment. This location was the origin of their travels. They keep returning to it, yet the location is never quite the same as any other time they have been there. Here, the scribe gathers supplies, some paper, a bottle of ink. The diviner sips from a flask found in an empty birdcage, and the inspiring liquid causes her to declare that they must descend the ladder they find outside the window which takes them to their next location. Yet this return to the point of origin is not unproductive. Among the papers the scribe takes are, quote, a number of notes on the kingdom of Kush that may have come from the hand of our own Seagal, end quote. This ac accidental acquisition of knowledge is unsurprising to the travelers, as archive materials are often discovered out of context and in the wrong place in this case, among the homework of the diviner's son. The archivist begins quickly working with the new materials. She, quote, begins making notes on the notes, cross-referencing, museum, she mutters, crocodile, wedding, trace. Her mutterings send the reader back to, into the story archive, searching for these words, hoping that they appear in the dream lexicon, or at least appear in a place that gives the reader more context for understanding. The readers do not find any of the these words in the lexicon or in Seagal's addition to it. Yet the words do appear in part three, Seagal's reputation. The readers then must wonder if museum is the keyword which takes the dreamer to a specific location or if crocodile, wedding, and trace are its associated meanings. The reader must return to the story archive to find, to try to establish any meaning or connection. They learn that museum refers to Sakal's wish to do research in the city of Khartoum. That crocodile is a metaphor for the sea in an ancient Egyptian manuscript that might describe the death of Taharquo in the land of witches. And that wedding appears in one of Sakal's dreams when the wings of crows tell her that she, quote, will wear a black wedding dress, end quote. The word trace refers to Seagal's third chapter of her dissertation in which she will have, quote, the chapter on gender, the chapter on animals, the chapter on the trace, end quote. 
in the same way that dusk, dry leaves, winter, and black bile invoke mourning, and thus can connect to the land of mourning, these words seem to invoke loss or loss of opportunities. So perhaps dreaming of a museum takes the dreamer to a land of lost opportunities. As data thieves, the best that the readers can do is realize that the meaning here is ours to make. We are navigating an archive in which order and re relationality do not inscribe meaning. Meaning is always partial and unstable within the archive. If meaning in an account of the land of witches is unstable and almost transitory, the physical archive appearing in the story is not. Samatar imagines the dream traveler's archive as bulky and substantial. The scribe describes the archivist carrying the documents on, of their quest on her back. Quote, this pack stuffed with paper and tied all over with sheaves, bundles, and scrolls weighs nearly as much as the archivist herself. Her strength der derives from the pack she carries, end quote. This metaphor of the archive as an organized conglomeration of different forms of knowledge that both weighs down and sustains, a project that requires deliberate attention, responsibility, and maintenance, mirrors much of the project of Afrofuturism as outlined by Bold, who describes it as, quote, both an archive and a living tradition, end quote. Sagal Said embodies this weightiness of, of this archival desire and the compulsion to act as a data thief trying to time travel to piece together Arda's story, merely by visiting sites where Arda might have been in the past. Segal's desires to add knowledge to the Afrofuturist archive by contextualizing Arda and Arta and uh, Taharquo's documents overrides her judgment. As she goes against the advice of her professor, her friends, and her relatives to enter a nation at war. Her return disappoints her family who see her immigration to America as a story of success within itself. Her brother continually tells her, you shouldn't have come and laments, why did you have to study history? Her Canadian uncle who has paid for her education says that she has stupidly and arrogantly wasted the family's resources. The ending of part three leaves Seagal's fate ambiguous. However, her work survives seemingly scattered throughout the dreamscape, fragments collected and archived by the intrepid dream travelers, one of whom literally carries the story of Arda and Seagal on her back so that others might one day find the land of witches. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was wonderful. Thanks so much, uh, Rhonda. Um, so moving right along, our next um, presentation is from, um, Adam McLean. Adam is a MA PhD student and first year writing instructor in the Department of English at the University of Connecticut. Today, his presentation is called Only an Echo, the Memory of the Archive and the Archive of Memory and Lois Lowry's The Giver. Thanks, Lucas. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Okay, awesome. All right. <clears throat> In Lois Lowry's The Giver, the archive of the world's memory is housed within the receiver of memory, a position given to a member of the community who becomes an elder who has great honor. In our contemporary world, the archive of our memory is dispersed between libraries and books, in institutions and records, and memes in the internet, physically or virtually kept and allowed access to if access parameters are met. Um, the archive as mediated and enclosed within a body is an intriguing idea that I will be engaging with today. Although Lowry does not give specific reason or logic to the world's collective memory housed within a single receiver of memory, the image of the anthropocentric um, archive in The Giver versus the institutionally enclosed archive in our contemporary world, and the concept of partitioning off of memory and history for the community in The Giver versus the semi-democratic openness of archives provide generative literary moments that allow us to think further about our use of memory and history in our contemporary moment. Indeed, it is my contention in this paper that Lowry's approach to memory and archive in The Giver reminds us that archives need meaning makers to act alongside their physical material in order to influence society. To approach this argument, I will theorize about the use of history and memory within a community that prizes sameness in the now rather than diversity in the future and postulate what it means to our approach to the archives. Published in 1993, The Giver has enjoyed almost 30 years of frustrating grade school students and intriguing budding science fiction lovers. 
The Giver tells the story of Jonas, an 11 who is selected to become the next receiver of memory when he and his peers turn 12. The receiver of memory is an intricate part of Jonas's utopian community because he or she controls the archive of history that represents the time before the community conformed to a sameness that keeps their society static and stationary. This archive of memories holds at bay um, the progress and change societies other than Jonas's experiences. As Jonas receives new memories and develops an awareness of what has been lost by the community's choice to conform to a focus on the now rather than the past or future, he develops the desire to return the memories, and thus the function and meaning of time, progress, and change to the community. When a new child his father has been nurturing, Gabriel, is scheduled to be released, or to use contemporary terms, euthanized, Jonas kidnaps the child and leaves the community, which he hopes will allow the memories he has received to dissipate back into the community and open their eyes to the problems with the society Jonas discovered through experience the memories himself. Even as the society um, partitions off the collective history of humanity to a single archival body, the community of the giver is not, in fact, completely opposed to memory. Memory actually seems to be a key aspect of identity formation and community building. At the beginning of the book, Jonas is trying to parse his language to determine if he is frightened about his upcoming ceremony of 12, in which he will receive an assignment from the elders of the community. To determine his use of language, Jonas remembers various things, a plane flying incorrectly over the community, the reaction of the community to that error, and a friend's late arrival to class. Because of this memory that he has, Jonas is, able, is then able to determine the word he'd use to approximate his feelings about his upcoming assignment, apprehension rather than frightened. The memories he has from his own life inform his use of language, which thereby creates his sense of being and identity. Remembering to form identity does not just occur with Jonas. If it did, we might have to consider it only a factor of being the potential receiver of memory, a part of seeing beyond. When Jonas shares his apprehension with his family, um, for example, his father points to each December, um, noting that um, he remembers each of them throughout his life as he tries to console Jonas about his feelings. During the actual ceremony of Twelves, the chief elder even brings up a communal memory, that of Asher, a new Twelve, not being able to remember the difference of snack or smack, to bring levity and enjoyment to the long ceremony. And in a more sobering use of community memory, the entire community performs a ceremony of loss together when they lose a young member of the community, quote, murmuring the name throughout the entire day, um, less and less frequently, softer in volume as the long and somber day went on, uh, so that the little four seems to fade away gradually from everyone's consciousness, end quote. Jonas remembers this event, even if it is meant to help um, the members of the community, the member of the community fade away. When a new child is given the same name as Caleb, it is as if Caleb returns to the community, thus forming a continual use of memory for both dealing with loss and celebrating return. Memory, then, or at least short-term one-life memory, is used to build and connect the community. Remembering leads to community formation, in other words. Memories are not just the only way of archiving the present single-life memory within the community. The community also keeps records or physical archives. In the center of the community lies the Hall of Open Records, where one can request to view their age, can see their volunteer hours, and can even play in recreational activities on the lawn outside. A good society, it seems, at least for those who chose to create the community into which Jonas was born, is a smooth bureaucratic machine with records to understand what's occurred. Like in our own society, the archive of the community's memories is prized and kept apart from the more profane activities, but it is important in my analysis to know that the physical records are actually kept. In addition to the Hall of Open Records, the community has the Hall of Closed Records, which collects the records pertaining to various ceremonies and rituals that are held privately in the community. During his training process, Jonas asks the giver about his father's performance of a release of twins, in which the nurturers in the community decide which identical twin will survive in the community and which will be released to elsewhere. The giver explains, um, quote, all private ceremonies are recorded. They're in the Hall of Closed Records, end quote. And then he and Jonas watch the release. Although the Hall of Closed Records is only mentioned once within the text, we can extrapolate that this Hall of Closed Records performs much of the same purpose as the Hall of Open Records to keep the bureaucracy of the community moving forward. But the closed records are for those activities like release that can be seen by reader and the receiver and giver as something more than how the community views it. That hiddenness seems to hint at a nefarious purpose or a need to keep those specific records of release away from the community and away from prying eyes. When Jonas watches this release, he is finally awakened to the meaning of the activities performed routinely in the community. He, like the reader, recognizes the release of the new child um, twin to be euthanasia or murder rather than a release to an idyllic unknown elsewhere. 
It is this realization that sets Jonas on a path of subversion and rebellion, but it also is a point that makes archives points of interest in our society. They are able to make meaning, and that meaning must be made between archival material and discourse around that material. Archives must be imbued with meaning while also imbuing meaning in order to have an effect on society. In other words, as I read The Giver, um, the importance of the archive is not just the archival material, even Jonas's community holds on to the archival material, but also the discussion and critical thinking applied to that archival material. For Jonas, it was the memories of the past in the discussions with the giver that um, gave him perspective on the current events of the community, enough to recognize his desire to enact a change. Indeed, Jonas would have never seen the record of his father releasing the new child had he not been engaged in a conversation with the giver and the giver offering um, the record to watch. While Jonas recognizes this personally and it leads him to enact a change that affects his entire community, the community recognizes in many ways that an understanding of the past must lead us through our decisions to the present. In other words, the community acknowledges a need for the wisdom of the past, but due to the decisions of those who made the rules for the community, that wisdom is mediated through a single body, the receiver of memory. During the assignment ceremony, the chief elder skips over Jonas. When she returns to him, she expresses that he is not to be assigned, but selected. The difference of selection and assignment is one of positionality. If one is assigned, then that assignment is given to you. If one is selected, then one is brought forth into something else. The bringing forth shows that the receiver of memory is set apart. This um, selection is also a self-selection. The chief elder um, lists off five attributes the receiver of memory needs, intelligence, integrity, courage, wisdom, and the capacity to see beyond, to which Jonas is able to confirm personally if he fits the criteria um, as the chief elder expresses how the, com the committee of assignments believes he does. The setting apart of the receiver shows his or her importance to the community and the importance of the job. However, even though the receiver of memory is important, it does not mean he has power or an effect or affect on the community. When the giver and Jonas are discussing how the community went to a sameness that removes the diversity of thought and body, Jonas tells the giver that he has, quote, so much power, end quote, and might be able to change things. However, the giver cuts Jonas off and corrects him, quote, honor, I have great honor, so will you, but you will find that this is not the same as power, end quote. This refrain of honor rather than power returns when the chief elder calls the receiver in training as preparing for the job, which is the most honored in our community. And when Jonas's parents state that Jonas has been, quote, greatly, um, been greatly honored, um, greatly honored, end quote. And when the giver reminds him that it is a great honor to be the receiver of memory, and Jonas remembers that they told him that at the ceremony, the very highest honor. Language, as Larry explained to Jonas at the beginning of the book, is of utmost importance to the community. And so the difference of power and honor is important to attend to. Power, as Jonas uses it, means influence or the ability to have an effect. Jonas believes that the giver can change the minds of the committee of elders because of his power backed up by the archive of memories within him. The giver amends power to honor, expressing that while his views and the history residing in his body are important and provide crucial support to the decisions made by the Council of Elders, he cannot make them do specific things. This lack of ability is seen when he expresses his regret over the community's release of new children twins, saying he wished they didn't do that, but having no power to make a change about it. Um, so as I've established so far, even in a world in which a community has enacted sameness and does not necessarily need a past or a future because they live in the ever-present now, the community expresses a respect for history and memory in the archive. There is a key difference, though, in the response of the community in Jonas. Jonas, as the receiver um, in training, has the means to make meaning of the past, whereas the community collectively gave up that ability. This meaning making then is what I find of utmost importance in an archive. It is not just the memories that the archive holds. It is also the way those memories are interpreted, analyzed, and used. This is the key reason the giver provides Jonas, or this is the key reason the giver provides Jonas when he says um, he must stay with the community rather than aiding a 13 year old boy and a baby in the wilderness. The community would fall to chaos with the onslaught of memory and emotion that comes from Jonas's crossing into elsewhere. The giver needs to be there as a guide through the process of understanding the archival memory. It is this reading from the giver that I apply to our contemporary archives and our conversation today about science fiction in the archive. Archives, like the Hall of Open Records and the Hall of Closed Records, contain artifacts and material that can be accessed by different people. However, access does not always mean effect or affect. While an open and accessible archive is what we should be working toward, we must remember that meaning must be made between the archivist and the archive for the archive to do something in the world. If an archive does not make meaning, it becomes like the receiver of memory 
holding great honor, even highest honor in a society, but not able to have power over decisions or the way society progresses. This meaning making I am attesting to can be done in various ways through coursework, for example, in a university, through individual research, through guided presentations like we've had today, um, and through public outreach, just to name a few. But it must be attended to through the network of archive, meaning maker, and archivist, just as it was between the giver, the receiver of memory, Jonas, and the memories themselves. Um, so to conclude, I turn to the giver's own conclusion, which ambiguously shows Jonas riding down a snowy hill toward a house as he hears music echoing from the community he left. Um, many uh, scholars have debated this, ambigu this ambiguous ending. Is Jonas really flying down a hill on a sled to a house perfectly prepared for Christmas? Is it just a memory keeping him or Gabriel warm until they die in the snow outside the climate controlled community? Did the community receive the memories Jonas took with him? Did chaos result as the giver thought it might? The last line hints that Jonas hears music, the thing apart that pointed out um, the giver as a potential receiver of memory, just as color did for Jonas, um, coming from the community. But ultimately, this music is only an echo. In my reading for this paper, the ambiguity, the ambiguity serves as a message and a warning because it allows us to think about our current situation. As I have offered, archives must consider not only what is contained within them, but how meaning is made by the materials um, within. If we read the end of the giver as the community receiving the memory and then being filled with music, which is why Jonas hears only an echo, we see that the giver staying allowed music and the memories to enter the community and thus allow meaning to be made. The echo is present because that music is expanding out from the community and Jonas, now removed from the community, hears only a small part of it. However, the echo can also be read in a different way. The echo comes not from the community, but from the memories Jonas received. He hears an echo because he remembers the community, but his leaving had an, um, no effect on the community. And as such, the echo is more a symbol of his relationship to his former community than to the community as it became post Jonas leaving. The only and only an echo does the work here, making it just an echo rather than the echo being the significant part of the sentence. It means that only a little work occurred due to Jonas's big decision to leave the community. Whether read a um, as a positive or a negative, though, we are reminded that we do not want our own archives to become only an echo, but rather perhaps a symphony, or at the very least, a pleasant song to personal and communal growth. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. New dimension to a text that many of us have known since childhood. Um, so to round out our uh, presentations today, um, we have a joint presentation um, from uh, Kenrick H. Kamiya Yoshida and uh, Dr. Ida Yoshinaga. Kenrick Yoshida is an Okinawan speculative writer, fiction writer, and independent scholar. Uh, Dr. Yoshinaga is an assistant professor of science fiction film at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And they're here to present on an Okinawan speculative arts archive. Asai Asai, today we would like to talk, talk about what constitutes indigenous Okinawan speculative fiction and its inclusion in a larger Okinawan archive. Uh, Shuri Gusuku Castle in the, is a symbol of Okinawa serving as a seat of power for the Ryukyu Kingdom for over 400 years. U.S. and Japanese forces destroyed Shuri Gusuku during the Pacific War in 1945. In 1950, the remains of the castles were named a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but under Japanese government, the castle did not undergo reconstruction until 1992, becoming a museum of artifacts for visitors. In 2019, the castle burned down due to an electrical fire, and Okinawans all over the world felt the loss of not only the castle, but the artifacts within, and Okinawans wondered if the castle would be resurrected again. Okinawan speculative fiction and speculative arts in general come from the series of colonial events and produced cultural loss and informational destruction. At the center of the genre are ripple effects of the Typhoon of Steel or the 1945 Battle of Okinawa, which resulted in the mass deaths of a quarter to a third of the indigenous population and extended the double colonization by both the US and Japan. This event reverberates in all directions of time and space. The Typhoon of War not only costs Okinawans their lives, but also destruction of Okinawan artifacts causing an information gap. While physical objects of Okinawa were lost, Okinawans have recovered their history, culture, and arts of the islands through oral storytelling and performance and song. 
Surviving Okinawans also recreated or reconstructed their physical cultural items by repurposing discarded American GI gear into cookware, housing, and musical instruments. One of these musical technologies was called Kankara Shin Sanshin, a string instrument made from tin cans and spare parts. Okinawan SF comes from the reconstruction and repurposing of traditional folk tales and legends and bringing them into to modern Okinawan and Japanese audiences. This can be seen in teleplays of indigenous Okinawan writers Kenjo Tetsuo and Uehara Shozo in the Ultra Q, Ultra Man, and Ultra 7 TV series out of the imperial capital of Tokyo. The post-war 1960s and 1970s shows were aimed at young audience, Japanese audiences, but both Kenjo and Uehara embedded their wartime experiences and Wartime experiences and experiences of racism by Japanese against Okinawans in broadcast shows about alien invasions, city destroying monsters, and ancient dispossessed people. Another way Okinawans repurpose the folk tales and legends is the local hero Tokusatsu show Rujin Mabuyo, broadcast during the early 2000s. The show supposes a world where issues of colonization and imperialism do not exist in daily Okinawan life. Instead, the show focuses on the ethics and values of indigenous culture aimed at both Okinawan and Japanese audiences. The show asks the viewer to imagine a world where people treat humans and other beings humanely and that they embrace Okinawan values as worthy of treasuring and practicing. These shows ask the audience to suppose a worldview outside the status quo through a seemingly childlike sense of play between humans representing the real world monsters representing the spiritual world and superheroes negotiating ethics between the two realms. The narrative technique is what Grace L. Dillon citing uh, Gerard Desenor calls na the native giveaway. Then quote, native authored SF extends the mini Diwag traditions of ironic native giveaway of storytelling that challenges readers to recognize their positions with regard to the diasporic conditions of contemporary native people, unquote. In the Ultra series, the basic plot involves a monster of the week out to rampage in a Japanese city. While the audience expectation is kaiju mayhem, Kenjo Tetsuo embeds iconography of the typhoon of steel, like carpet bombing or the sea to land artillery bombardment of towns. These images create a cognitive dissonance in, the, in viewers and make them question exactly what are they watching? Is it, is it a children's program or is it something more? So how do these examples of Okinawan SF fit into the Okinawan archive? I believe like Kankara Shin Sanshin, which, is over, which over time has become a valued instrument in its own right. These shows are Kankara or tin can repurposed folk tales and legends about Okinawan history, culture, and values. Kinjo and Uehara are now revered writers and visionaries of Okinawan literature, not just Tokusatsu TV. Rujin Mabia has placed itself in a position of perpetuating the Okinawan values and culture for its viewers. These shows propose not only a metaphor for the politics of Okinawan life and its people, but also supposes an alternate world, a what if history had not flowed as it did. This allows for both Okinawan and Japanese viewers to re-examine re their own knowledge of history, historical and personal events. This is something that Okinawan filmmaker Kazuhiro Taira did for his first film, Murka City Koza. The movie starts as a time traveling comedy about an aimless teenager that is catapulted into the past to experience life before the 1972 Koza riot. This riot was not only violent, the only violent Okinawan protests against post-war US presence uh, um, on the island. The film takes a darker tone the film takes a darker tone during the riot scenes as it questions the idea of finding indigenous justice through violence. Writer, director Tyra frames the riot and the colonial military occupation that it provoked as a kind of dystopic beginning to the dysfunctional present day Koza. In a plot twist, the main character learns from the past that Okinawan rock music can unite Okinawans so that they can heal and form a different future together. Miracle City Koza is a good candidate to be included into the Okinawan SF archive because it teaches the audience the modern day history of Okinawa through the through a kind of playful ironic humor, drama, and heartfelt, health, heartfelt enthusiasm. I would like to close with the thought that Okinawan SF is not 
just affecting Okinawan proper, but also diasporic Okinawans and Okinawans at heart abroad. For example, notable speculative fiction series creator and longtime Star Trek franchise producer Ronald D. Moore has said that Okinawan music inspired his development of the millennial SF shows like Battlestar Galactica. Also, diasporic Okinawan Bolivian American animator Natasha Allegri has infused Okinawan aesthetics into her cult cartoon phenomenon Bee and Puppycat now on Netflix. These works of art must also be added to the archive which cannot be restricted to the works from the homeland. Okinawan SF is just a natural and living extension of the traditional Okinawan archive categories. In 2020, reconstruction of the Shuri Castle began and like Okinawan SF, the Okinawan SF archive is ever reassessing, reconstructing and reflecting with the progress of time. All right, this is my, my part of our presentation. Um, in their introduction, Imagining Indigenous Futurisms to the now classic collection, Walking the Clouds, an anthology of indigenous science fiction, Grace L. Dillon writes that the purpose of native giveaways, or as my writing and research partner here has explained earlier, curative stories told in an ironic way, ones that taunt the audience by implicating their part in the lesson conveyed is to, and I quote Dylan directly as she cites Gerald Visner here, uh, quote, avoid becoming, and this is the second quote is Visner's, a mere archive covering the earth with empty traces of a lost plenitude, unquote the Visner quote, but we're continuing the Dylan quote, a public memory that only exists through its exterior scaffolding and outward signs. Our aim here today is to move away from discourses marked by such exterior scaffolded forms of plenitude, from the surface of public memory, from the mere archive, towards engaging deeper spiritual and social meanings and survivance actions of cultural communities. How can archival methods enact what information and communication technology scholar Andre Brock calls, quote, critical technocultural discourse analysis, unquote. Um, and he shortens that to CTDA. Rather than center on the romantic iconography of the future, whether that future is utopian or dystopian. How can archival methods center the embodied, culturally shaped, critical information practice of different communities expressing their social and spiritual concerns through the imaginative arts. I have examples of archival practices from the Pacific, most of which involve mass recruitment and indigenous led training of knowledgeable native Pacific Islanders and native Hawaiian thinkers into professional library employment positions. So if any of you can imagine, um, instead of largely white librarians um, collecting Afrofuturist work and, you know, looking through, um, you know, Black produced archives, if um, Georgia Tech or other libraries like City Tech actually went into Black communities and every year recruited, uh, recruited Black librarians and information scholars, and then put them in charge of making their own categories. Um, of genre, categories of, of um, organization of the information. Um, other examples involve community-based intellectual conferences in on indigenous space-time. And this is uh, so as to reflect upon the technocultural basis of narrative genre in order to reshape knowledge categories, including the category of what is speculative fiction, um, reshape genre boundaries and definitions, and reshape the sociolinguistics of the colonial information sciences. Uh, so if anyone is interested in those practices uh, in the Pacific, I'm happy to share them. Um, not being either an information scientist or an indigenous um, scholar myself, but, but an ally um, who's kind of been around that type of movement for quite a while. But um, for now, I'll stop right there. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so this has been a very um, packed and provocative um, series of presentations. 
Um, does anybody have any questions um, to open up our discussion? Yeah. yeah, I don't see any in the Q&A right now, but um, if there's anybody, if you want, if anybody wants to drop it in the Q&A or um, in the, you know, chat, although it would be preferable for it to be in the Q&A. I can start with a question and that's simply um, if uh, Ida wouldn't mind expanding on, um, you know, these practices in this, the Pacific of, of archival practices and perhaps how they dovetail um, with uh, what Kenrick was talking about with respect to the Okinawan, Okinawan archive, uh, if at all. Okay, sure. Um, I guess one of our, our um, well, a host of our colleagues um, in the wake of the Native Hawaiian sovereignty movement, uh, which really, um, it came to fruition in the 1990s and early 2000s, um, you know, trained a generation of of um, indigenous scholars to say, we want control over our own archive. And so like a generation later in the 2010s and 2020s, um, there was mass hiring and training in little clusters, you know, and over the years of indigenous librarians and information specialists. And one of the first thing they did um, at least in Hawaii, uh, Native Hawaiians did following the Maori model from New Zealand, Aotearoa, is they realized that categories are colonial categories. You know, what is speculative fiction and fake or made up versus what is real and more documentary? That's that's a colonial division, right? A lot of so-called folklore and legends are considered history in, in many Native traditions because the lessons they bring are relevant and current. You know, so that fiction versus nonfiction doesn't quite yeah. exist. So allow the archive, recruit archivists from community who already have that cultural knowledge, get them to reshape um, the archival categories, um, and then have them constantly in touch with community um, through practices such as the one that Kelsey Hutton mentioned during the break, living consent, right? That, that, that once you get permission to have an archival piece of text, it's not forever. You're always in touch with community. Community can say, we don't want, we don't want permission anymore and bring it back because some information is private or is sacred or is, you know, special knowledge. Anyway, do you want to talk more? Um, no. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say to that. Do you want to talk about Okinawan curation? Um, yeah. Yeah, the idea that that the Okinawan archive uh, would be inaccessible or- um, Fixed. Fixed or non-circulatory. Circulatory. That that's kind of a Western framework as well. So I um, I would imagine something like um, mm -hmm. that it would be accessible to everyone, mm -hmm. and that one of the ways to go get around mm -hmm. the circulation is, um, of course, digital mm -hmm. digital information or even um, something like three uh, D printing. You know, if you wanted to look at a, a musical instrument and it's in the archive. You could you could right. basically 3D print it somewhere else, All right. and it could have at least a facsimile of it. Also, the points of curation are not professionalized and specialized in that kind of professional way. So you have different cultural leaders and community leaders, and they're very happy to tell you what belongs in the archive and what doesn't. Exactly, and that's an yeah. ongoing, uh, vibrant, <laughs> right. democratic discourse. Right. You know, right. but in the U.S., you we're not used to that kind of very grounded vibrant democracy where we're really into you know you vote or you've lost your your turn and right, let right. let the specialists be in charge right you know so you know we're talking different kinds of democratic informational yeah, practice because yeah. yeah. okinawans are continuously discussing and rediscussing and reevaluating re things so you know nothing is ever fixed mm -hmm. per se mm -hmm. Um, but it's a you know the archive would be alive basically mm -hmm. it would be a living thing mm -hmm. and not not a fixed mm -hmm. fixed static thing mm -hmm. yeah so maybe somebody Great. else though. wonderful yeah no that's that's very helpful um, and I think this this segues into another um, question uh, and this is for Jacob uh, from um, from um, Jason um, which is whether there are examples or practices. In the in the examples that you discussed, that we might learn from or repurpose um, in SF 
archives and libraries, examples uh, perhaps that constitute imaginative extrapolations that stand out that you'd like to discuss that perhaps, um, you know, complement what uh, Ida and, and Kenrick have been discussing here. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. I was, um, uh, particularly with their their last comments, it's, it's that um, I think one of the things that not only sort of a, a cross-cultural examination of the definition of an archive is, but uh, but also what speculative fiction teaches us about what an archive is and what uh, and sort of what structure it takes, is that uh, a more imaginative approach to that can broaden our horizons about sort of what kind of collective practice, practice is and that sort of thing. Um, uh, my background is more in cataloging, but I have worked with uh, a number of archivists over the years, and in particular, I have a, I have a colleague who's very interested in uh, oral history, in sort of and uh, the collection and curation of that, and that I think is an example of sort of 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 living history in the sense that it's uh, it's sort of this ever moving conception of what a historical record is. It's actually uh, not unlike uh, a lot of what um, of what was being discussed about the giver earlier. Um, and, I, and I saw it was on the agenda and I, I almost was kicking myself for not including that. But it is uh, it does represent uh, historical continuity as a fluid and ever changing thing because that's always subject to evaluation. Um, in the examples I was providing, um, like, for example, uh, I didn't get into it quite as much, but in, for example, uh, the Stargate franchise, which kind of, in a way, starts as a, as a harder science fiction property and then becomes softer as it goes on, it starts to address a lot of metaphysical concepts about sort of the nature of consciousness and faith and sort of people's relationship to faith. Um, you know, it gets to the point where there are a lot of stories about not just information, but entire sort of people or even races of people, entire species being sort of stored in, in, in like a digital or non-physical kind of medium. Um, and so that sort of give, that gives a whole new definition to the term of living history uh, to the point where even even while being stored in that way, those people have kind of a consciousness and a will and an ability to affect the world around them. Uh, it, it's kind of uh, it's kind of analogous to in a way how even the uh, the 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 notion of 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 knowledge in itself be having kind of a consciousness. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the major antagonists for like a, a large portion of Stargate SG-1 are this alien race that have a, what they call a genetic memory, where they're, they, they transmit all of their memories and knowledge from birth to sort of the next generation. And there's an entire episode about one, about one of the main protagonists, the main human protagonists kind of experiencing this imagined scenario in which they attain that same information they 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 sort of are privy to this genetic memory and the moral of that particular episode is that even the possession of that information even though it's just information has kind of a a moralistic or ethical effect in and of itself so that even its its presence or its existence constitutes a sort of direction uh, in, in and of itself. So that's uh, certainly, I think that's one thing, uh, that's one takeaway that we can take, that we can sort of evaluate about the practice of archiving in the real world, in that it has kind of a directive unto itself. Um, it has a, a sort of a direction that it goes in, and it has a direction that it goes in, not just based on who is collecting it, but what is collected and how it is sort of ingested or displayed to those who sort of utilize its archival contents. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I actually, I have a question. Um, that's sort of related to this question of renegotiation 
of the archive. Um, you know, as someone, and I think a lot of us are are concerned, perhaps about about the the retrenchment of um, basically uh, white supremacy and in, in in the states, particularly uh, Christian white supremacy. One thing that I've noticed as someone who pays attention to these issues. It's kind of a weaponizing of this concept of renegotiating the archive and recovering hidden truths and recovering hidden. And in fact, one thing that was brought to mind by your mentioning Stargate SG, uh, taking that concept of ancient aliens in a much more reactionary direction, of course, there is a flourishing subculture of people, uh, right, who believe that that um, the uh, contributions and creations and, and monuments of indigenous people were were really created by white people basically or by by aliens who happen to look a lot like Aryans right and that this knowledge has somehow been suppressed or um you know excluded from the quote unquote official archive and we see different manifestations across the board such as you know even QAnon and the rise of conspiracy theories are sort of premised on this idea that there is an official archive of information whether it's about vaccines or what have you uh, and then there's the real archive that is somehow being kept. And so as I'm thinking about this, I'm wondering, are there, to what extent does this science fiction offer a lens for thinking about this complication, this, this um, weaponizing of what is really a colonial, a decolonizing project, right, of recovering lost histories? Does SF offer a way to think about how you know, hegemonic structures or imperial structures uh, appropriate that language of renegotiation, archival renegotiation, if that makes sense. And that's really for anybody. Um, I can say that, you know, it. Um, I think that in a, a lot of the examples that, that I brought up, and, and I'm, I'm also still thinking sort of of the Stargate franchise in general, is that one of kind of the overriding themes of, of a lot of the different Stargate shows is about expressing skepticism for things that are supposedly well-established. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of instances in which there are scenarios that are, are sort of treated as, as some sort of common or already understood knowledge. Um, in in the in Stargate's case, it's it's sort of it, it, in a way it's sort of applying that principle of of um, oh, you know of of taking away credit from indigenous populations, but it's in a way it's kind of applying that to the entire human race and sort of flipping that on its head. And yet, um, it is humanity's ability to to innovate and to question and to have scientific and intellectual curiosity about things that allows the human protagonists to oftentimes get a bit of an edge on these alien races that are, are millennia or millions of years more advanced and have a much greater sort of scientific understanding. Um, famously, there's a, there's an episode, for example, where they have to help an alien race fight these this race of sort of like self-replicating nanites, this kind of gray goo scenario. Um, and these super advanced aliens have been warring against them for generations. They can't quite figure out how to beat them. But it takes uh, it takes kind of uh, an outside of the box human approach to say, well, why don't we just take this this huge specialized spacecraft that you built to fight them and then blow it up? In, in the aliens in the alien machines faces it's it's sort of taking it's it's taking a non-traditional approach to solutions that sort of is emblematic of a lot of human solutions in that show and i think the same can be said for a lot of how they treat information retrieval and and sort of the 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 uh, I, I don't want to say appropriation, but more like the 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 improvisation of how to apply information in an in an, in an applied context. So, I mean, you can see that a lot in in sort of how information and knowledge is treated in the world. I'm thinking, for example, of like the 1609 project, um, which was a fantastic re-examination of a lot of things that were sort of for a long time were treated as as established fact as things that were sort of uncontroversial 
um, given knowledge about sort of the formation and genesis of this entire country. And, and then suddenly you have these, these very intelligent people and very questioning people come along and express skepticism about that and say, well, what if we reframed it based on these things that that we have examined, that we do know, and that we sort of step outside this narrative that we already have and try to create sort of a, a, a new story that better incorporates what we know in a way that is more inclusive to people whose voices have not been included in that narrative. So you can see kind of analogous things like that. And, and so, and sort of the, the pervasiveness of colonial thought in a lot of speculative fiction, uh, in a way, it, it can also embody its opposite, just given who, whose perspective it is going into that. Yeah, right. It, it sort of um, is the mirror image of, you know, obviously in, um, <clears throat> I think of H.P. Lovecraft and uh, is kind of more reactionary take on that, right? Which is that there's there's secret knowledge that of um, a nefarious cult that just happens to be distributed amongst like the non-white peoples of the world, and you know, um, it's it's just uh, interesting to think about how how uh, the meaning of this archival renegotiation is itself unstable and can be co-opted, you know, in the name of sort of actually reinforcing hegemonic hegemonic uh, knowledge. Um, so, uh, there's another question here for Kenrick and Ida. Are there websites or online resources, uh, that exist now where we can learn more about Okinawan speculative arts or any links, uh, where we can learn more? Oh, I guess, um, so Kenrick has a piece on Okinawan, uh, film and TV science fiction and coming up in the Rutledge Handbook, uh, of co-futurisms that Grace Dillon and Isaiah Lavender and um, Taryn Taylor, Bodhisattva, Chato Padhe, um, you know, is editing. Um, but we're, we're working on that. I mean, there's a lot of Okinawan cultural information on the web. Um, there's not necessarily a lot on, you know, this the intersection between that and, you know, modern genres like no. science fiction. No. Um, but that is happening in indigenous studies in general now, right. as film directors like Taika Waititi, right, are are doing horror and doing MCU stuff. Um, right. And so there's a demand um, for indigenous directors and writers. And I think it within the next five to seven years, you'll see a wave of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, it's the Okinawan boom, which is a kind of a cultural blossoming of Okinawan uh, culture and it happened in the in the 2000s basically early 2000s early 2000s yeah. and yeah. Uh, what you're what we're seeing now is this kind of growing awareness of not only the culture mm -hmm. but also the arts and how uh, it doesn't have to be traditional anymore that it can be mm -hmm. uh, reflexive you know mm -hmm. we can re-examine it and we kind of reassess it and we mm -hmm. re reconstruct it into something kind of new. Um, and also too, we're Okinawans are learning more about their, their colonized history. I mean, there is uh, now a, an awareness of uh, if museums are, are um, archives, then they Japanese museums have been taking bodies of right of the dead Okinawan dead and putting them into museums just as British and you know American and German museums you know we've had to or indigenous peoples like Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders have had to repatriate bodies and remains right, right. from these old colonial right. collecting places so the same thing applies to Japan and, and Okinawa, Okinawa yeah, yeah. So we really want to emphasize the archive of material objects in general, not just literary production, but right. cultural, cultural and media and, and spiritual right. production in general. Right. Yeah. And it's it's not just um, yeah. you know, like in SG1, it's not just inter, uh, intellectual property, but it's actually physical human beings being put into archives, you know. So it's not science fiction. You know, it hasn't been science fiction for a while. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. I, um, hey, Lucas, yeah, I have sorry, a quick question yeah. for, for Kendrick and Ida. Um, one of the things you mentioned was like that renegotiation of mm -hmm. the, the archive, which I thought was really generative. And I'm wondering 
how that relates then to like an archival's purpose for preservation mm -hmm. or like, you know, keeping history alive. Like how, do, yeah. how does that work out quite, if you know and can comment on that? Um, so, uh, just because I was, I, yeah, I was just thinking through that. So one of, one of my friends is a Native Hawaiian who does museum studies. And so American Studies Department hired her, not as faculty, but you know, relatively permanent staff. And what she does um, in the summers is she trains Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders who want to go into museum studies to go into archives and do their decolonial work there. And because of work of people like her, you now have major museums um, like in, in Europe, apologizing and returning remains with, and the Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders have often achieved this with no power, you know, just, just spiritual, ethical, cultural, artistic expression us give us our ancestors back and basically shaming, you know, ethical shaming. Um, and so that's been going on. Right. And it's, um, it's not yeah. easy. <laughs> and it's and it's not easy because they need allies within yeah. museums who right. are often not indigenous. Right. But what they've been doing is training generations of new uh, museum specialists who happen to be indigenous. And the classical um, relationship has been very colonial and predatory, right? Of the archaeologist or anth anthropologist or cultural. Um, historian versus indigenous person. But what they're doing is when you slide indigenous people in these professional roles, and then you also train them that their cultural questions, their community information is valuable, and they're allowed to use that, right, as they gather or regather, reorgan, then it can lead to some really powerful moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's no, it's, I think, with museums and archives, it's no longer like the days of Indiana Jones, you know, where yeah. you can go and this belongs in a museum. I dug it up, and um, I really go sell it to that shady looking guy. Yeah, right? and so. I think those days are are probably theoretically it was never those days. People just yeah. <laughs> decided yeah. it was those days. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. yeah, I mean, I yeah, I don't. Yeah. I I think it's. It's an exciting time. This is an exciting um, topic. Yes. You know, what, thank you. What, thank you yeah. so much to Jason. And, yes. And, um, and Jason's committee. Jason's yeah. committee and City yeah. Tech for, for bringing this yeah. to the forefront and mm -hmm. having us explore it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. thank you. And, and thank all of our um, wonderful panelists. It certainly has given me a lot to think about. Um, this has uh, been a wonderful uh, session. So we've come to the end and uh, I believe we're going to take a break, a uh, five minute break before moving on to the next um, paper session, which is about Latinx SF in the archives. So please do uh, stay tuned for that. Thanks uh, so much. Take care, everybody. Um, see you in a little bit. Yeah, thanks Thank everyone you. for Thank your, you. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, great presentations. And also just a reminder, after uh, the Latinx SF and the archive panel, we'll have our keynote address um, by Jeremy Brett at uh, 4.15. Uh, so let's take a five-minute break, and we'll come back together at 3.25. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>